For going on 20 years, I've been a mule deer meat hunter, putting one or two in the freezer every fall and enjoying the flesh year round. But over the years, it's occurred to me and nagged at me that I had observed thousands of mule deer without ever seeing the cagey old truly big bucks that had to be out there somewhere. I have never seen, like with a gun in my hand, the mule deer I'm after. Eventually, it got to where I couldn't think of anything else when I was in mule deer country. They're out there, I wanna find one. Once I get like, like, you're gonna turn into a bird watcher? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Steven Ranella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. It's a beautiful late October morning, the start of only the third day of a hunt with my buddy Ryan Callahan. We're in the mountains of central Idaho along a migration corridor used by mule deer as they move from alpine summering range to desert winter ground. I've come here to find the unfindable, a giant mule deer buck. It's something I've been looking for for many years, but each time, like Charlie Brown trying to kick his football, I'm met with crushing disappointment. We hiked in from the trailhead two days ago. Ryan brought me into his favorite secret spot just as the bucks were starting to get real interested in the does ahead of the breeding season. Right off the bat, we spotted a dandy, but our overzealousness cost us and we drove the deer out of the country. Just like that, walked out of our lives. After a frustrating day and a half, we spotted a black bear late yesterday. I'd love to get that thing. While going after it, Callahan stumbled onto a small group of muleys and shot himself a nice buck. That night we dined on boiled tongue while Ryan recounted the story of his successful hunt. It was the best possible hunt. Now we're back at it. We're gonna use our binoculars and spotting scopes to tear this place a new one and hopefully find a true monster. It's our third morning out here. Me and Callahan are halfway into our big Idaho meal deer blowout. Our first, I saw a couple dandy bucks, some of the dandiest bucks I ever see. The problem is, the area we saw those has some other dudes working it real hard. There's deer everywhere this morning. I've seen three bucks up here, one buck down here, one buck over here that I'm looking at now. I don't even know why I'm looking at him. He thinks he's pretty cool, but he's not. There's so many does around. I old outfit everybody always used to say, with this many decoys, you just know there's some old gnarly buck. Just a patience game. I want to point out that Kelly, he's single. He lives in a posh mountain town. He's a homeowner. He has a job. Fit. Single. So ladies out there should be looking up Callahan. The only reason he can't go out and find the ladies, he's remodeling his place. So you gotta bring the fight to him. But if I was a worthwhile, honorable woman, I'd be going after him. He's a good guy. Grab Steve. You should come look at that. What's going on? All good things out. It's, I mean, it's noticeably bigger than everything else I've seen this morning. But you should make the call. I think you should sneak right past our tent to the edge of the timber. Yeah. And just glass those draws. Okay. Coming up, and I'll come around that edge and pick you up. Okay. Hey, 
see that like blonde, like coxcomb ridge right there? They came wrapping over the top of that. And they're like right here. It's an open phase. And the big, I mean, there is already a group of does and some smaller bucks there. But then the group of three bucks came in and one of them's worth looking at, like I said. Where should we try to take a look from right by? I think that green tree right there. He's got dual kickers, if you're into that sort of thing. One, two, three, four, five, six. He's five on his right side, six on his left. There's two kind of box. There's box I'm not that interested in, and there's box I'm real interested in. I'm real interested in that box. He's pretty buck. I like that box a whole bunch. I'm going after that box. This is just what you hope for on a spot and stock hunt. You find your animal a ways off and you get a situation where it's not too likely to move during the time it takes you to get over there. Maybe it's bedded down or quietly feeding, or in this case, infatuated with a slow moving doe. A million things are going through my head during the long period when I'm out of sight of the buck, dropping down and then climbing up towards a ridge line that should put me within reasonable shooting range. Part of me wants to run up there, but the better part of me knows that getting to that ridge when I'm out of breath and shaking would be bad business because it leads to bad shooting. Of course, there's plenty of things that could go wrong, and by now I've seen them all. A coyote runs them off, another hunter gets on them, the doe gets annoyed with the buck and takes off with the buck in tow, or the buck gets a good whiff of the doe, determines she's not ready to rock, and heads off for new adventures. But I know those things are all beyond my control. At this point, I'm just trying to focus on composure. He's totally ignoring that doe that he's been chasing all morning long. He's got to be 350 yards away. Stay there. He just remembered the doe was there. She keeps flicking her tail and he can't resist. When my brothers and I were kids, our old man put stickers on the inside of the upper limb of our bows that said, stay calm, pick a spot. While closing in on this buck, I'm imagining that sticker. Control your breath, squash your excitement, check your expectations, be a good predator. You can get excited later.
and shed a few layers, get ready to start packing some meat. Shock. That's great. That is really something. I've spent so much time looking at mule deer and hunting mule deer and eating mule deer, chopping up mule deer, and all <laughs> over all those years chasing these things and looking at them, I've really grown to admire them more than any other animal out there. 20 years, I've been just wanting to, <laughs> I'm wanting to run into a buck like this, man. Oh, I like these things so much. Nice hunting spot you got, Callahan. Where are you taking me next year? <laughs> oh. I got a spot up here I want to show you. Can't turn it back in if you want a bigger one. No, I'm pretty happy. Ah. You got it in a steep enough spot. Left hand. What do you think, man? I'm ecstatic, man. That looks like he gets heavier up top. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that is amazing. Oh, dude. Look at his face. Oh, he's a giant. Look at his body. It's like a cow elk. How far the shot? 392. Was it? If he was 10 yards further, I wouldn't shot. Yeah. Like, my, I have a 400-yard cap. This place is amazing, man. If I was you, I'd have never taken me here. Normally, I just take the skull and meat from a mule deer. But with this one, I'm gonna keep the cape so I can sell it to a taxidermist. He's such a big animal, like just big, healthy ears, all clean, huge, thick neck. The neck is. Yeah, that, you know, a guy that wants his deer to look like it looked, you know, when he shot a big old buck, would very well want that cape. Average mule deer capes are a dime a dozen and there's really no demand. But the cape of a mature buck like this can be gold to a taxidermist. He can turn it around and use it for another client who's got a shot up or otherwise mishandled cape of his own. Deer have real thin hair under here. It's just thin, thin fur in there. And I've had taxidermists say to me, it's very hard to stitch that and get it to look legit. So it's best not to be messing up here in this area and not to be messing up this little colic of hair it runs down here because you can't stitch it up in a way that looks natural. One of the trickiest parts is getting the hide out from around the antler bases. Don't cut it. They say that you can thin the hide too much. If, you, if you're cutting it with a knife, you want to actually pry it loose. I'm using just a regular screwdriver on a multi-tool. And you can actually pry that hide off, and it comes off real clean. Okay, so here's one that's all clean. Like this piece is all natural, no cuts. That's like the parts that are actually joined up. You can almost kind of see like a lip. If you're gonna have a deer mounted, you know, it's best to have that so that someone's not trying to do repair work and winds up looking like a hack job. Look at this fat, man. You just don't see no. that. Fat I that, mean, that's just yeah. like extra, extra fat. I would say it's a safe assumption he wasn't chasing does and being all aggressive a week ago. He was just getting fat. He goes into the rut in the best shape he'll be in all year and he comes out of the rut in the worst shape he'll be all year. They're going into the winter in such bad shape that it just doesn't really happen to males to get that old. They don't get old like those. They go from being top of their game to dead.
There's a couple cuts to get left in the woods. Rib meat, neck meat, shank meat tends to get left in the woods by people who don't realize that it's such high quality meat if it's prepared right. You're not legally obligated to retain the neck, ribs, and shank, but you should. It's just like, you just gotta find the right ways to cook them. I've never prepared neck from someone who wasn't astounded by how good it was if done right. Over the last few years when I've been sitting around drinking with my buddies, I've joked that I'd happily burn all my hunting gear and take up something pointless like golf in exchange for just one big old muley. Like blues legend Robert Johnson selling his soul to the devil in exchange for mastery of the guitar, my thinking was that you need to pay for what you want. And some things go beyond the normal currencies that we deal with in daily life. But here, now, with this buck, I see that the real paying needs to happen though it's hard to identify the limits of my indebtedness. I owe something to Callahan for sure, and absolutely to these mountains. And I owe something to the animals, to their long-term well-being. These are debts not easily paid, but I'll damn sure try. With a successful hunt behind us, Ryan and I have some time to kick back at a friend's place near our hunt area. Oh, I got it. Having the luxury of a nice kitchen and grill instead of just a campfire means I can cook up a whole mule deer rump roast. One of my favorite preparations with rump roast, or just muscle groups in the back leg, is to do simple roasts. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna cook this piece of mule deer rump in a pellet grill where I can set the temperature on the thing and have a fixed temp. So I got 500 degrees, put the meat in there and just let it go. It's the simplest way to do things if you have a grill that's compatible with that kind of cooking. Since I'm cooking on the grill, I'm just gonna put some oil on a plate, roll it around in there. I have coarse ground pepper and sea salt, and I'm gonna sprinkle a very liberal coating onto this thing. It seems like a lot of salt and pepper on there, but you're only getting whatever salt and pepper is on the little ring, like the little rind on the outside of it. That piece of meat is now ready to go on a grill. So I'm cooking my roast on a wood pellet grill. In a way, you could think of it like a oven with smoke. In that, it has a thermostat on it, and it's very easily controlled. So it's kind of as simple as doing a roast in your oven, but you get a lot of extra flavor from the smoke. From this point, I'm gonna forget about this thing probably for the next 15 minutes. I'll just go about my business. In a different kind of grill, like if you're cooking in a regular propane grill or a charcoal grill, where you have a more direct heat on there, you wanna monitor it more and don't leave the area and run the risk of having a lot of flame lapping at the meat and over charring it. As it starts to get done, you'll notice that when you press it, it'll run like a, like a watery blood or almost like an oily watery blood. And right now it's kind of a bloody blood. So I know that needs a few more minutes. Once your roast is at the right temperature for how well done you like it, be sure and let it rest for about 10 minutes before you slice into it. This gives the juices time to reabsorb back into the meat and to not run out all over the plate. Look at that. Oh, that's gorgeous, man. Red rim. I feel like I'm down in Texas right now. Look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's close to beef at this point. Yeah. I feel like this year, we kind of like witnessed something that you maybe won't see is that I'm talking like public land. Anyone can go there who wants to go and hunt. Yep. It's a kind of license that anyone can go buy, resident, non-resident, whatever, that in three days, I saw three of the nicest bucks that I've seen in 20 years of chasing mule deer, says to me that I witnessed a special set of circumstances, time of year, climate, right? Yep. That is not likely to be replicated. You know, you know the old, like, should have been here yesterday? I was there yesterday. I was there. I'd be like, you know, in fact, I was here yesterday, and it was nice. Thank you. 
It's like you I was been here. I was, you weren't, but you should have. For once in my life on Mule Deer, I was there yesterday. Yeah, man. On the day you were supposed to show up. It felt just good. I mean, you've seen it. I have terrible timing. Our timing lined up, yeah. the season lined up, the dates lined up. I was there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs>